Hello and welcome to the second edition of Spinoza Sessions. Here I am your host, Baruch Gottlieb, and I am here today with uh, James Facho, which I, who I will uh, introduce to you in a moment. Uh, this is coming to you live from Berlin and from Kaohsiung, uh, Taiwan. Uh, and also from uh, Westenhag, which is, uh, for most of you uh, may know, a uh, cult uh, uh, contemporary art institution in Den Haag, where we're usually uh, <laughs> inviting many people to uh, visit our, our rich series of exhibitions, um, symposia, uh, workshops, and, um, and for people who just like to hang around in our alphabetum, our special space, which is dedicated to letters and the forms of letters. Uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, pandemic and the measures uh, being taken internationally to uh, confront this situation, we are not able to open our doors uh, and in the, uh, for the moment. Um, but in the meantime, we have uh, launched this uh, series called uh, Taustazine, of which uh, these Spinoza sessions is a part. And Taustazine uh, has a daily uh, offering on the Westenhag. Uh, website westenhag.nl where you can see uh, various uh, archival materials from the long uh, uh, from the long history of Westenhag exhibitions and um, performances and events uh, and publications uh, as well as new uh, materials including um, every Sunday a, a, a new uh, essay in the series Art and Crisis Kunst in crisis um, and uh, this series as well so we're trying to uh, generate a lot of new content trying to figure out what uh, what else we can do as a cultural institute as a lot of the a lot of cultural and contemporary arts institutes are doing at the time trying to figure out uh, making the mother uh, new and fresh um, things to enjoy and to think about uh, another thing to mention is that uh, we will also be having another uh, Spinoza event, the Spinoza Circles, which is uh, something that's been running for about a month, uh, about a year, over a year actually. Um, and at the end of the month, uh, we do it every Sunday, and this Sunday is no exception. And you'll find some more information about that on the Westenhag website, westenhag.nl. So uh, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you my guest today. And uh, let me see if I can get this smoothly over. Uh, James Bacho. James Bacho is an assistant professor at the International School at Isho University in, uh, uh, now I forgot, uh, Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> where uh, yeah. you teach courses in filmmaking, aesthetics, and storytelling. He's the author of two books, the latest uh, being Terence Malick's Unseen, Unseeing Cinema. And uh, you've written for Media, Culture, and Society, Journal of Sonic Studies, New Soundtrack, Film Philosophy, Studies in European Cinema, Cosmos and History, Deleuze and Guattari Studies, and our famous uh, Tropos Press. And you're uh, working mm -hmm. on a new book called Audibility, The Philosophy of Hearing and Listening. So. Uh, Welcome, James. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us, uh, being our second guest. Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting, Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking uh, forward to so, it. Uh, maybe we could start a little bit with your, um, your diverse uh, interests, uh, because I noticed it's an, uh, another interest we share, which is sound studies. Um, uh, tell, tell us a little mm. bit about your, your new your, your book on audibility, and, and does that have any connection to uh, your interest in Spinoza? Yeah, um, well, I've always been kind of dissatisfied with this idea of cinema as something that is sort of distant and presented and sort of seen in an analytic or analytical perspective or sort of the gaze perspective. Um, and my interest in sound is, is less about sound um, as a phenomenon and more about experiences of hearing and listening and those being imminent to the film itself or the film world itself. And so this led me to these to pursue these concepts of audibility and unseeing. Um, so unseeing then would be kind of a, a condition 
um, rather than a you know an object that is not seen it's a, it's a state of unseeing and Malik being someone that I think is um, you know very um, a very good example of this kind of idea um, and because his films work in sort of memory and presence and recollections and and that sort of thing uh, it's this kind of um, you know movement of time um, and there's this kind of this indiscernibility you know between what is happening now what is happening then um, these kind of aspects of cinema really appeal to me and so he was sort of the perfect um, uh, artist I guess to sort of explore these ideas and so that's kind of how that came about right so um Yes, speak a little bit more about uh, this unseeingness. Uh, is this a response to uh, overload, visual overload or overload of visual culture? And uh, I know that I know Malik's early films that are which are extremely long and, and visually lush but minimal. Uh, so how, how, how does that, all that mm. work and, and where does the audibility come in? Yeah, so it's the idea that, I mean, obviously his films are very visual and very, um, you know, rich uh, visually, but it's it's the question of where those images are coming from. Um, so if we think about the, if we think about a concept of audibility, which means that we're gaining, it's another faculty of understanding um, and imagination other than, you know, present seeing. So if we're in a state of unseeing, as I call it, we're actually creating imagery in our minds. Um, and what I'm proposing is this is what Malik's doing, is it's basically thought. It's, um, you know, that's mixed in with present moments. So unseeing is a state of creating new imagery from, from one's hearing and listening. That's an engagement with time and an introduction of another duration that becomes visual. So it's sort of the, the creativity of, an, of memory and imagination. So it's actually not a blindness. It's not a not seeing. Unseeing opens to another possibility of seeing something as a new experience. Is it a parallel vision that something is going on in your mind? I mean, what is the, where, where, where is the distinction between thought and imagination there? Well, it would be an, it would be a, an image-based um, process of thinking. Um, if we think, and this goes back way back to ancient times of the ideas of um, poetics um, and, you know, poesis, the idea of making imagery from storytelling. So I'm sort of, you know, taking it from the approach that, um, that yeah, that the, that the images are being created in a sort of state of um, another kind of awareness or another kind of opening um, within any given moment. Okay, and so how does the audibility come in there? Is that uh, bringing another sense of time or another? Um... Exactly. So it would exactly. So it would open to this. So so audibility, hearing and listening, you know, these states of hearing and listening, and I kind of make a differentiation there, kind of open to these um, the this imagery that I'm talking about. I don't know if you want to say that it's a trigger, but something kind of. Um, opens to another another way of you know recollecting and imagining at the same time so sort of these moments of reverie i guess bachelard uh, is another uh, another um writer that i kind of worked through he's got a, a book called the poetics of reverie um, i'm looking on my bookshelf right now um in which you know reverie kind of opens up a new duration in a similar way Okay, can we go a little bit deeper into that? So now we have another uh, another sure. level, which is the level of memory, uh, which is so mm -hmm. we are uh, so this aud audible uh, dimension uh, creates a certain depth or another yeah dimensionality where uh, not only there is a level of imagination but also uh, reverie, memory, recollection. Yes. And all of yes. these things are right. Repetition, repetition, mm -hmm. in a in a Kierkegaardian sense. So Kierkegaard is also a big part of this in, as well. In what way? Well, the idea of repetition, well, the idea of repetition is, um, is 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 the idea of kind of a returning to um, you know a, a state of opening up 
what has happened, but in a very spiritual sense with Kierkegaard. Um, and then, you know, Deleuze writes about this as well, um, but they have kind of different concepts of, of repetition. Um, of course, Deleuze. Uh, yeah, so, so no, sorry, I mean, go ahead. The, the, the term or the, the concept of repetition or the trope of repetition is absolutely central for early Deleuze, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and we can think of it in terms of the of recurrence in, in um, Nietzsche as well. Okay. So how does all how now, now I'm getting a um, I'm getting a, a a landscape, let's say, or a uh, I'm getting a yeah an impression which has many uh, mm. different dimensions, and these dimensions are also temporal. And somehow the temporality right. is uh, made accessible through the, the audible uh, experience, right? So, so right. There's uh, an right. audible because it's not seen. Uh, maybe resonates inside the cranial space, or <laughs> it can it be said to imagine inside the mm -hmm. part of the thought process, right? Not the part that is. Uh, illuminated through the eyes, but the one that is uh, the one that we we kind of sense uh, or we int intuit, and maybe we're going now towards uh, Spinoza with the, the uh, intuitions. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. So how do how, now how, this 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 brings to mind uh, a very rich, polyphonous, polydimensional experience of the present. Yes, exactly. That's that's it. Yeah, a, a, a simultaneity or a coexistence is is underway. Yeah. And so, uh, can you can you connect that? I mean, you've also done a lot of uh, reading on on Deleuze and Spinoza together and, and apart. Can you can you uh, mm -hmm. reflect a little bit on uh, from from that those readings on this this uh, simultaneity that we were just uh, touching on? Well, I don't know. If, um, well, I don't know. If, um, in Spinoza, so much the idea of simultaneity, but there is the idea of um, the idea of, of what is being expressed, the idea of expression, which kind of opens up a new, you know, any any thought is durational, just like any listening is durational, um, you know, that opens up kind of a new a new process of of thinking, and then you know, in, in Terence Malick, nature is a big part of this, and so um, it kind of leads into um, this this idea of, of expression of the idea of what is being expressed um, through the sounds that we hear and the images that we hear and I'm talking about both you know lived experience and in terms of a, of a film like like Malik's film but um, one of the things that appeals to me about Spinoza is just this idea of um, this this imminent nature um, as a form of expression um, you know, through the attributes that are um, that are being expressed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that element at work in the in the book as well, and I think that that's at work in in Malik's cinema as well, um, in the sense of this Spinoza's third kind of knowledge, um, which is sort of, um, and we can dig into that, um, which is sort of trying to make a um, uh, an alignment, um, whatever is being you know, expressed, trying to whatever is being expressed, trying uh, to create some sense of um, with God's expression. being with God's expression, um, which is the, um, the trickiest, aspect which is the of, kind of the trickiest of, aspect of of Spinoza's of thinking on so, on the idea of thought kind of is um, this third kind of knowledge. It's almost, it's almost inexpressible. It's almost ineffable, a, a and that's why cinema is such a, a, a powerful uh, way of doing this. Sorry, I'm kind of um, rambling. But, uh, sorry, I'm kind of yeah, rambling. That's what but, this, um, uh, that's what this <laughs> program's for. It's, uh, um, you know, we can sort of dig. But into um, this, you know, we can sort of dig into, into this. Is this what this idea of when we think of thought and we think of expression, we tend to think in, in the sense of language, or we tend to think of in the sense of some kind of clarity of of thought. But there's also just this idea of these moments and these durations. 
these moments and these durations and these expressions that are poetic and then in a in a visual sense in an audible sense um you know that opens up to a different kind of thinking that is not so you know bound to some kind of end right um that's kind of living for you know just the expression of nature itself and thought being a part of nature this kind of alignment and then being in tune with um with god a kind of intuitive understanding of god i see so uh this is a this is hearkening back to me to um some uh studies i've done in taoism because uh this does seem mm -hmm. to be uh to have a an as we say in philosophy, uh, uh, no t teleology uh, right. or lack of. <laughs> so well, right, the same thing. There's that idea well, of I was telos, the same uh, thing. There's that idea of the telos. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, uh, continue. That's uh, where we uh, attempt to find all that we need in the present, right? And uh, right. yes, right. Um, this is uh, something that inevitably leads you to the monastery, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that thought has come to mind. Believe me. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, I no, mean, there, there is go certainly ahead. a attention, or one might say, to use another philo uh, much maligned uh, or some sometimes appreciated philosophical expression, uh, dialectic between uh, temporality. Uh, our sense of time passing and this appreciation for a uh, rich present and a thick present and all the complexities, even complexities mm -hmm. is, is a Deleuzian uh, uh, trope uh, in the fold uh, of the present, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. And there's, it's, I, I yeah. really and there's, it's, I, I really gravitated to, well, to literature that expresses that, that as well. We find, we find that in Deleuze, we find it in Kierkegaard, we find it in, um, uh, Borges, uh, we find it, you know, it's so many different writers, um, Proust, uh, this idea of the lingering moment that, that where we find in this moment of finitude, we find eternity, um, and that eternity is expressed with infinitude. Um, it's just a beautiful concept. And, um, so that's something that I was looking at as well. Um, but you're right that, um, I mean, there's this idea, I mean, some of the connections between Spinoza and more Eastern Taoist or Zen thoughts is, yeah, this idea that there's no telos, there's no end, because Spinoza says, right, that um, God has no end in mind. Um, it's, it's, it's we who kind of think these ends and form these kind of blocks um, that to God doesn't doesn't even matter. But um, I, I do have a I, I, I do have a, a certain affinity to these to these Eastern ways of thinking because because it allows you to kind of enter in without having to um, control things I guess um, and and let the expression be the expression. It it comes to um, it comes to uh, again, this kind of dialectic, though, in, uh, I mean, I guess when we're talking about literature, we're talking about philosophy, uh, written philosophy, at least. Uh, maybe that's something that where we can make the mm -hmm. distinction, because, of course, uh, Spinoza comes from a tradition of the earliest written philosophy, uh, the Hebrew philosophy, or the, um, but, of mm -hmm. course, that is a transcription of, uh, of um, oral tradition philosophy uh, which uh, and 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 the right. and the actual transition between oral imminence and right written abstraction is Absolutely. is central Absolutely. for for him uh, and and maybe this in mm -hmm. a way I mean uh, I, I've tried to examine this in my own work recently that this is a kind of a uh, uh, I mean the, the alphabet itself is a kind of original sin um, that you know, the tree of knowledge is the tree of, of writing or something like that. There's something there whereby we get split out from imminence and, and thereby have to deal with the 
again, this dialectic between the, the imminent truth and the Im inadequate knowledge that we are condemned to condemned or whatever fate uh, whatever uh, we are uh, uh, born into uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, the circumstances of and uh, right. yeah and right. so again you know through in literature also in cinema which is a very I mean temporally okay now that's where Malik comes in as a as an interesting figure again because it it has this he does explore this somewhat timelessness I mean it's on the edge of I mean, I know mostly his early films, so those extremely long scenes, which are, which, you know, really play with the, the notion of timelessness. Of course, it can't possibly be timeless because it is actually a physical strip of film going through the projector in a sequence, right? And, and this thing was recorded and developed onto celluloid at a certain point. I mean, this whole process is historical. It's not imminent at all. But maybe that just the fact that it strips away as much as possible, it really allows us to uh, tickle or elaborate that, that, that liminal, uh, uh, that dialectical realm between uh, imminence and rationality or, or I'm not sure, mm -hmm. abstraction. Sure. Yeah. Sure. A lot of good. A uh, lot of good stuff there. I, um, for my I mean, part, I, I, and for my part, I, I, and you know, Malik, Malik himself has said, I think you have to let go and just be with the film. Um, and I agree with him in that sense. For, for me, I'm. Uh, I don't even. I don't even think of the technological aspects. Um, of filmmaking, because to me that's not why we're experiencing it. The the reason why we are are, are we've fallen into a film um, is because it's an aspect of experience in ourselves. It's an aspect of memory and imagination in ourselves, and we have these durations ourselves. Um, we just don't have something that structures it. In the same sense of music, music is structured noise, right? So we go out and we listen to the everyday sounds of things, um, and we have some kind of biological response to what's going on to all the sounds around us that are tied in with survival, that are tied in with pleasure, that are tied in with desire, and all kinds of different things. What music does is it structures that for us. It structures that survival kind of feeling for us or those those different effective relationships for us. Um, and I think cinema works in the same way when it's something like that, when it's an experiential kind of cinema or an imminent cinema. You have to imagine that when a film starts, you've been dropped into the middle of some experience. So there's not even a start. I mean, Aristotle said that in his poetics as well. That no story ever begins, right? We're always dropped in the middle. But I think someone like Malik who, who was really working in these this kind of non-language based poetics um, really gets it that thing that you were talking about at the beginning there which is which is um, language is a kind of abstraction I mean it's it's its own experience right but it takes on because it's recorded it takes on this kind of thing that I can get to it later and I can always have it later um, but these non-linguistic, these non-language experiences are very interesting to me um, because, yes, philosophy is working in language, but then there's the possibility of philosophy that doesn't. And I think the interesting thing is through technology, we're able to eliminate the idea of technology and fall into something that, that hits at a very base level for us in terms of how we live. So that's kind of the thing that really affects me, I think. I, get... I don't know if that makes any sense at all. I don't sure, know if that sure. makes I mean, any sense I'd like sense you to go a little bit deeper into that, uh, uh, into your, uh, what you were, you were trying to get at with the, with the reference to technology. How does it, how does it get deeper? Mm. Well, I just find it interesting. The fact well, it, I just find it interesting the fact that this technological medium, it, you have to get rid of the of the idea of it in order to gain what it's going to give you. Uh, if you're thinking about the you know the the reels of film, I guess it doesn't even work that way anymore. 
But if you think about the, the you know, the technological apparatus, as so much of film theory does, which drives me crazy, um, then you're really not looking at a film for the right reasons. Um, to me, I agree with Malik. You have to let go um, of the technological in order to do it. And we could look at the we could look at the idea of God and substance in the same way, you know, in a Spinozan sense, that there is this idea of this thing that is creating this world, right? That is an expression of think of, the film projector as substance. think of the film projector as substance, if you want, that there's something being expressed. But, you know, it's that's the, the point is, what is being expressed? What is imminently occurring? That's more interesting to me than, than this idea of cause or this idea of what the thing is that is enabling this experience to happen. Because, again, it's more. It's more in tune with one sense of memory, one sense of imagination, and one sense of dreaming. Those are really the things that we kind of tie into. And it go, it's not only uh, images, but it's also the structuring of, of music and the structuring of sound um, that kind of pulls all of this together. Um, the music analogies are very strong in, in that sense. Yeah, I, I, I never really read uh, Spinoza from the uh, reflect reflection on music. I don't even know if he mentions music ever. No, he, I don't think he does either. Not, not no, he, I don't think he does either. Not, not in anything I've come across. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I was just kind of vamping there off the top. Yeah, I was just kind of mm -hmm. vamping there off the well, top. Well, as of you're head. a sound, sound designer, but I think it, yeah. it, 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 uh, these days, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of sound artists who are influenced by Deleuze's interpretation of, of Spinoza, um, who are, who are working on, on this, mm -hmm. this working through these, these notions of imminence and extension, um, and, uh, connectivity. Mm -hmm. I think it, there's a lot to, lot, a lot to take there, mm -hmm. uh, also in just engaging with, uh, what, what Donna Haraway calls the thick presence, right? This very rich entangledness, mm -hmm. uh, enmeshedness of, um, of, of materiality of uh, uh, of of the of the universal materiality, which expands in every place, in every mm -hmm. direction, and which we can mm -hmm. only uh, possibly <laughs> ever know. Although we can, in a way, know all of it, uh, and we do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we, mm -hmm. uh, if we try to look carefully at any of it, then uh, we we lose that um, that. Imminent knowledge. Yeah, and Spinoza talks about. I mean, he writes. Yeah, about and Spinoza yeah. talks about. I mean, he writes about this. That that all of knowledge is there, but but we only we only gain we only ride this you know, this certain mode or this you know this expression or these attributes. We right. We can't possibly get the infinite. We don't. We can't possibly get the infinite. There. But it's and there. Is it is it productive? Right. Is yeah. that uh, you you mentioned that that. Uh, that somehow uh, existence is being produced, or is it? Mm -hmm. Is there? Um, mm -hmm. There is a process. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what, is it productive? I wonder. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question. Well, I'll go back to what you were saying. Well, I'll go back to what you were saying earlier. I really liked what you were saying about the idea of. Um, if you know, you like, in, the if you want to think, if you want to think about the ancient times of storytelling, I do. What's the what's you know what's the reason for telling what's stories? The, what's it's what's the reason for telling right? stories? It's, it's an ethical binding, binding, right? It's it's a sort of create a moral sort of sense right? for the so for the community, right? Kind of so how do you how do you create this kind of uh, moral structure through storytelling? Right? Well, you make it memorable, so right? And so you have to appeal to someone's sense of imagery. You have to appeal to someone's sense of um, you have to have repeating. You have to have it be poetic. It has to have a verse. It has to have um, a certain meter. It has to have a certain structure, and then that's how we come to develop the stories that become the moral kind of ground of, of a community, right? This is all being made. The whole idea of, of poetics or poesis is the idea of making, right? And so it's it's sort of making these ideas in your head. And then one of the reasons I think why Plato laments the invention of writing is, or the coming of writing, the overlap of writing, 
is that we lose that capacity. We lose that um, sense of kind of the immediate presence of things and the and the um, the, the the coexisting levels of, of our imagination and our creativity um, and the and the moral lesson and of of the experience of living and of learning and and living and and um, so you know all of that. So um, that I mean that those the old if you think of cinema in that way if you think of the expressions of nature in that way it's it is tied in with this idea of the fact that we are living in in a duration that is that is multiple that is um, expressing in multiple ways what we listen to and we look at what we listen to and what we look at and what we feel and all of that is a matter of, of our choices and our things that we're going to attune to and, and disregard, things we're going to remember, things we're going to forget. These are all sort of sort of building the fragmentary nature of, of what it is to have memory and have imagination and uh, repeat these things in our own minds and repeat them to others. I mean, we have language as the thing that kind of um, lays it out there in a, in a pattern or a, or a sort of strata. But there's so much more to experience. There's so much to experience um, that is possible. And I think this is one of the things about Spinoza that's so appealing. You know, it's that everything is this kind of infinite set of possibilities that it's up to us to kind of choose and work through. Choose and work through. Hmm. So I see you. You are, are looking uh, to Spinoza for, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, to uh, for a kind of a retrieval of these, um, in a way, of this uh, of this polyphonous uh, realm of possibility, this radical openness uh, that may have been more available earlier. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, but the well, the funny thing is, I just I just made okay. this connection just now yeah. <laughs> in this conversation. Uh, but sure so, uh, but I'm sure that I have been reading mm. that in him because it is. I mean, interesting. It, it seems to me that okay. Well, we have like with the split, with the Platonic split, which is also, of course, the the record uh, as well, uh, uh, well uh, researched by Eric Havelock and and after that, uh, Innes yes. and McLuhan. Yes, exactly. Of the introduction exactly. of the alphabet, Walter it, sorry, and Walter Om, Om, yeah, yeah, Walter Om, Walter. yeah, um, yeah. So this uh, this moving away from the integral acoustic uh, experience to the uh, linear uh, technolo what we consider today technological uh, uh, form, uh, of course, which unleashes great mechanical capacity uh, power. Um, uh, right. Uh, right. By, of course, in the abstraction, it's the abs abstractions are powerful, but they they create an an abject uh, something forgotten, something neglected, uh, something left behind uh, in the process of of abstraction, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. So uh, then there's this tendency, and of course, McLuhan was also one who was who was saying, okay, well now in the electronic age, we are uh, in a new, in a, we're retrieving old tropes from the age of uh, simultaneity and that we are returning to a kind of acoustic space type uh, experience where things are happening all at once and mm -hmm. we're getting this kind of resonant uh, experience. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're navigating through the world through m more dimensions of experience. So that, and maybe that also has to do with like mm -hmm. the electronic uh, environment providing us with all kinds of layers of memory and information, you know, from various dimensions. Mm -hmm. However, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a highly now it's a highly mediated version of that, right? It's like a, it's a simulacra, maybe as <laughs> another French yeah. uh, thinker yeah. uh, might have put it, that it is a simulacra yeah. of pre-Socratic experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's mm -hmm, something mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's what you you when you're working as an uh, an audio artist or as a film artist today and exploring these other dimensions these like maybe non visual prioritized non teleological uh, experiences you encounter and you have to navigate. Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we have a few people still watching, um, and uh, the, I mean, we, we haven't lost too many people actually. Uh, uh, I know uh, J Jeremy's there, uh, probably still <laughs> oh, watching. Hi, Jeremy. He says oh, that. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, he says your your sound is is a little uh, strange, but uh, uh -oh. it's uh, it's characteristic. Uh oh. Um, and uh, and some other people. Uh, I see that Sabina. Uh, I can't pronounce that name, but I, I will pronounce it very badly. But uh, Sabina has uh, given a suggestion uh, that you check out, or I check out, or we check out, uh, Adventures in Immediate Irreality by Max Blecher. Uh, that's going to be in the chat. So, uh, okay. And okay. Uh, yeah, so if anybody's uh, following along at home, um, I guess you must be at home. I mean, what are you doing out there? I, don't, you know, go outside. don't go outside. Don't go outside. Um, then, uh, if you have any questions for uh, uh, James or some uh, reflections that you'd like uh, James to also uh, respond to, then uh, please um, pop them into the chat in the in the YouTube chat, um, and we can continue uh, talk a little bit more about uh, imminence and transcendence. Um, so yeah, so uh, how does that work uh, for people who, uh, since that's something that is uh, quite important to you and you've spent some time thinking about it, for people who are not really, um, you know, that uh, philosophically literate, uh, what is the important distinction between uh, 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 transcendence and uh, imminence and why, what in, in Spinoza uh, is, uh, makes that uh, particularly pertinent? Yeah, this is something that I was thinking. Yeah, this is something that I was thinking about from the very beginning of my studies, actually at EGS. I remember. Um, you know this, but, but taking that now you you know this, but but taking that long bus ride up the up the mountain, heading towards the EGS campus, and your head filled with expectations of what have I gotten myself into? Um, I remember just just thinking, you know, just looking at the beautiful landscape and thinking about the idea of transcendence, and and what an interesting idea. That is, um, so that's a very clear memory that I have. That's that's that I have. But that's always been interesting to me, and it, it, it took until reading uh, Deleuze quite a bit um, to get to this distinction between imminence and transcendence. Um, so if we think, I mean, transcendence has very, it's it has many different meanings in, in philosophy. You know, if you if you think in, in the, with the existentialists, um, you know. Um, Simone de Beauvoir and um, and Sartre and the idea that you um, idea that you, the, you aim to transcend your condition or or something like that. That's not that's not quite it. Um, the other meaning of transcendence is the idea that there is a transcendent reality, um, and that is the idea of God or something that is that you have you think of it in terms of a line that there's a divide between the world that we live in beyond, and then the, uh, this world beyond that is the, um, God, uh, that is the realm of God. Um, and the way Deleuze kind of plays with this, the way uh, Deleuze kind of plays with this um, and he, uh, he, um, first one, he says sorry, that the that first one, or sorry, that, that transcendence, the transcendent realm is, is, a, is, plan, is a plane or a plan that is hidden and designed and already and made. The imminent, the imminent and then the imminent, the imminent plane or the imminent plan is something that is composed rather than already organized. So that, so when you think of it in, in this sense that anything is is possible in in the imminent sense, but nothing is possible in the transcendent sense. Um, so imminence is kind of the for itself kind of plane um, of being composed or of. of of being uh, made in the making, and it's interesting. Um, I'm trying to think of which. And it's interesting. I'm trying to think of which um, book it is, it um, but it might be his um, big Spinoza book. Um, sorry, I can't remember. But he sees. I'm sorry, I can't remember. But he sees the transcendent realm in terms of like colors and a, and a picture. There's a very formal and structure to that. The realm is more like and then he says that the imminent realm is more like music and sounds and silences. So it's kind of interesting that he um, makes that kind of. Um, metaphor out of it. He's not known for his metaphors, but he makes that kind of thing as an example. The imminent realm is unformed. It's constant movement. It's constant affective relations. 
So if you think of life in terms of transcendent, that there's always something outside of yourself that's impossible. And it becomes kind of dogmatic and dictatorial to think in that way. If you think instead in terms of imminence, that then everything is possible. Um, that everything is um, in the Spinozan sense of expression of God that is at least available to the possibility of thinking. Um, so I don't know if that helps to clarify, but 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 um, with imminence, there's every you know nothing is divided. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's. I mean, definitely, like in Spinoza. Um, we again, we uh, the the materiality of existence, the entirety of existence, and that uh, uh, has many what what Spinoza calls substance. I guess yeah, uh, yeah, has t many attributes. Only two of which we uh, have access to uh, uh, extension mm -hmm. and thought, and that in that he's mm -hmm. following Descartes, of course. And but but God is in all of that. God is yes. in in yes all of the stuff that we do have access to and what we don't have access to. And and in us as we do or do not have access to that. And so uh, there is mm -hmm. no outside. There right. is no place for right. planning or predestination or. God to operate and right. construct stuff, and uh, of which we are not a part. Right. Whatever is being constructed, should that be the right metaphor to use, uh, is constructed through us as well as through everything else in the universe. Something like that. Well, yeah, that everything's po everything is possible and you have to be careful with this word possible but that everything is is there because it's all god it's all because it's all god it's all god's expression right and then um and then everything becomes kind of a um expression of that an expression of that but it's um but it's it's interesting how radical um spinoza is willing to go with that idea um it's it's really because it's 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 really hard to conceive it it's really hard to conceive the idea of 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 a, of a um, sort of like a pure imminence. Um, because how do we even? Because how do we even, with language, even 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 think through that? Um, because we're so accustomed to the idea of of, of a division with God. Um, but if you know once. But if you know once you start going through all of the all of the propositions and something like. Uh, the it's ethics. Just um, it's just amazing how it's it's all kind of referring back you know kind of referring back to this this idea that no there really is nothing outside really there is nothing outside everything is God's expression everything is everything is expressed through God and then it's up to us to try to try to and this again is maybe the Taoist kind of thing but try to attune to that and try to find a relation with yeah and of course being that we are in this strange situation where we are both, you know, we are, we are uh, intractably God, part of God, uh, mm. but at the same time mm. have this weird, in German they have this word called Maka, which is like, is a perfect word for this, like a problem or something, this quirk, which mm. uh, does not ha allow us to have perfect understanding or perfect what is it knowledge uh, adequate knowledge yes. of our condition yes uh, creates a situation a, a dialectical situation again whereby we have we can have a project and that's where the project of the ethics comes in again um, uh, that uh, that that if we are able to overcome our certain different differences between us through reason we together between us humans can uh, accomp produce something you know more than we might otherwise <laughs> yeah we have to go through these stages yeah we have to go through these stages of knowledge with spinoza right we have to not just rely on imagination and the inadequate ideas and you know the habits and the familiarities and things like that we have to really practice um, reason, 
practice uh, reason um, through the adequate ideas through the uh, adequate ideas as, um, a of, as a way of again it's I it's, see it as like, it's I almost see it as like light and we have to a beam of light and we have to jump on you know, the beam of light you know it's uh, you could you could sort of um, it's sort of ways, picture it in, in different ways, but it's almost but impossible to, to picture. Our, but we have to use our our reason to to. I don't want to say correspondence. But I don't want to say correspondence, but kind of try to God harmonize with what in God, God is doing creation. in God's I mean, creation. God's I mean, everything is God's creation. Everything, creation. even our inadequate creation, ideas, are God's part of God's creation. For but ethical, for us to be ethical, we have to come to the. We have to come to the. We have to adequate ideas. We have to practice our reason that is a movement to a kind of accordance with God. Kind of accordance with God. And then we can get to that through kind that, of, through that we can, you know, through the common notions and all, that, notions and all of that. Well, then we can kind of get to the idea third of knowledge, this third kind of knowledge, which is this more intuitive relationship with God. It's, it's, it's just nutty, but it's, it's so just amazing. nutty, it's but it's so amazing. amazing. It's such an amazing structure that he builds. I have a question from the uh, viewers. Uh, from uh, AIC mm. host, what does James James think of the link between imminence, transcendence, and the meditations? I think uh, those are, or and meditation. That's not the Descartes meditations, but uh, ah. uh, uh, and ah. meditation, uh, which opens doors to those two intuitive concepts. And then there's a second question from AIC host: If it is, if all is inside. If all is inside, then transcendence is also. It means we can touch part of it. <laughs> uh, that isn't thinking a process, but an information that comes from a feeling, a sort of instinct. I don't know if I can understand that question. Mm. But maybe you, some things mm. came to mind uh, when... Uh, well, let's take one, one thing at a time. What yeah. was the first one? Meditation. Um, well, that would be... Uh... Well, that would be. Well, that would be um, I don't know if Spinoza has something to say about meditation um, because that's not really his his effort. He wants you to be more active, I think, um, in how you're coming to um, this kind of accord. I, not, that's not to say that meditation is necessarily passive, but um, but I think this is kind of. But I think this is kind of exposing a difference between, for example, Zen and um, you know, sort of a, a Spinozan way of, of thinking about things, and that. With Zen, you have, you have to. to get rid of the, the idea of you almost have to itself. get rid of the the idea of reason and itself. Suzuki writes um, about this. And, and Suzuki, Suzuki writes Zen about this. Um, that Zen is is in not is not idea that you, that you feeling this idea that you that you, that you think, think conceptually and, and, and that you will always appeal to reason. You know this kind of more enlightenment way of thinking about things. This Western yeah. way of thinking about question, things. Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I wonder what he would think about the idea. I, I wonder what he would think about think? the idea of meditation. What do you think? Um, uh, I I uh, I think that there's part of, part of the purpose. I guess part of the purpose of the ethics is a supplement to meditation in a way that uh, you have. Um, I mean, you know, this is before TV and movies and everything, and uh, you're supposed to just take a couple of propositions of the ethics and meditate on them for a while and let them sink in, right? Uh, I imagine uh, right. that's, that's what uh, the ethics is. is right. it, it, ha it, has a, it has a contribution to make to personal meditation, which I guess was just something that people did. I mean, med meditation is not necessarily uh, Buddhist meditation, of course. Um, and certainly, uh, that is the process of dif differentiation and distinction, uh, where you try to distinct, distinguish, uh, what is real from what isn't. And uh, this is just the practicing honing your, your capacities. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in, on the other hand, what you were talking about with uh, Zen Buddhism and uh, Zen meditation and, and Taoist uh, meditation, certainly the challenge is to. Uh, to empty your uh, consciousness uh, and to uh, refrain from thinking. I mean, understanding right. that your thinking is yeah. hard, whatever you think is just flotsam in the general, uh, the general 
flux of materiality and life and non-life and there's really nothing uh, I mean th there's nothing that you can consciously think about that's going to help you get closer to that so uh, better just be just live <laughs> in the moment and be in touch with the, the mm -hmm. immensity of mm -hmm. existence um, that is a Maybe a re that maybe that is in terms of uh, Spinoza's uh, uh, understanding of of imminence, uh, a kind of reckoning or a kind of fathoming of of imminence. You know, it's an exercise to set to to reconnect with imminent existence to the degree that you can. Again, without going to the monastery and doing it professionally. Mm. Uh, because in, in, eventually you have to, that's mm. always the, that is our challenge, right? In, in civil society, uh, you know, in, in, in highly developed so-called civilizations or social orders where even our ability to meditate peacefully, Zen or not, is afforded by a lot of whatever order around us of people who are not meditating. <laughs> and, and there's, there's got to be some mm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. a relation established there, some kind of civic relation there, I think, at, at, as a, a conscious person. And, and Spinoza was certainly someone who was concerned about what, maybe what kind of society would provide the, the best circumstances for people to do a profit, to, to benefit from meditation. Because he was, you know, he was living in a very young republic. Mm -hmm where law and order had just been reestablished in a in a particularly you know in a, in a particularly fluid way uh, uh, in, a, in a new way that was you know more tolerant in terms of uh, religious uh, practice than others had been previously and uh, and so yeah I don't think that you can restrict Spinoza's concerns only to meditation or to imminence for sure. Mm. I uh, got some more comments mm. here. Sure. Uh, Emily has written, can sure. we relate even rationally to Spinoza's idea, Spinoza's ideas without using the word God, replacing it with something that does not evoke this traditional religious notion? Yes, of course. Uh, 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 Spinoza, can, I, can, <laughs> I can respond there. Maybe you have an, uh, uh, also a response. Uh, Spinoza interchangeably uses God and nature. In fact, he uses a, he just puts a slash between them and just puts God slash nature or God or nature. And there's many, many incidences throughout his writing from the earliest writings uh, where he, he uses God and, and nature uh, interchangeably. So if whenever you, uh, you do not want to use uh, God, you can use... Uh, uh, nature, or you can use uh, the immensity of existence or something else. <laughs> There's the, the figure of God is, is, is everything. That, in that sense, it is the Tao in, in Taoism. There's, I, don't, I don't think that there's a, a distinct, distinction that can be made there. The God in Spinoza is the Tao in Taoism. See, there, I, I make a little bit. See, there, I, I make a little right, bit of a distinction. That, um, you're that, right that that, that um, he does. Sometimes he uses a slash, and sometimes they, they, it seems like they're equal. I think of God as I think of God as equal to substance in Spinoza, and then I think of nature as as, as the means for as God as the means for God substance to um, express. So nature is kind of um, so nature is kind of the expression of God and substance. Of, that's, that's of God and substance. That's that's the way uh, I think then, you know, of it. Sort of um, but then you know we could sort of dig through and and pick them apart. And, and pick there them is apart. something. It, the, I think there is something. I, mean, I think to. to I mean, if nature, because if you're going to equate God and nature in Spinoza, is, then it most definitely is pantheism. But that's a, that's a debatable topic. That's very topic. That's very. I think deep in Spinoza and difficult to. That's that's well, we could write papers on that. I think you know, in a way, I mean, but maybe that's you know what you're what? doing. <laughs> Pantheism t sounds bad, right? So, sounds like you shouldn't be shouldn't be doing it. Um, mm. uh, but I mean, I think the problem <laughs> is theism, not the pan. 
like uh <laughs> is that you know mm, mm, mm. we do not need to inordinately prize uh that which is imminent you know that it's just there that's it um and we we got to make the best of it, <laughs> of it or or not <laughs> um right I mean, Spinoza is also very sanguine about what right. you know, what is right to do in these in these situations. But the the distinction between substance and nature, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, and that that's not a, a really important. I think for us to to, to define now. It's um, probably more of a technical thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's but probably certainly, more of a technical uh, I've thing, seen yeah. in, in many many instances uh, from his earliest writing this God or nature, and, and nature again is not the nature we see outside with trees and uh, right. uh, rivers and frogs jumping right. or what all that stuff. Right. That's, right. that's not what Spinoza right. means by nature. Uh, he means all that we can and cannot access. Uh, the entirety of existence, mm -hmm. that is nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that mm -hmm. part that we can distinguish as tree or plant or or bug or other things though those are the those are the correspondences with us you know in a sense it's very kind of heisenberg or, or i'm not sure if it's heisenberg mm -hmm. but right. you know that you know where the instrument is part of the data that's produced through the scientific experiment so we are the instrument right 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 um uh, AIC host uh, said he was just looking uh, to trying to to look at uh, whether imminence and transcendence can be experienced through meditation. Again, uh, can in can imminence and transcendence be experienced through meditation? Um, well, transcendence, what is that? I mean, are we are we throwing it out? Is it? Um, it depends on how we're defining the word. Is yeah. It, um, it, it depends it, on how we're defining the word. It, it, um, it, it is is transcendence an, an act of going beyond, or is it? Does it mean that you have gone beyond this thing that is? Because, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference yeah, there because sure, that's a difference because in, ex, in existentialism, trans transcending is an act that you do. Uh, that's a that's a that's a thing that you do. Um, but of course, if you want to think in that way, Sartre said we never can really transcend ourselves. It's the effort that we need to do, but we'll never we'll never be able to do it. Um, okay, so so it's a difficult it's a difficult um, is that kind of thing to say. But imminence, uh, imminence that. certainly through meditation. Right. Yeah, <laughs> imminence. Imminence certainly. Yes. And. I might as well pitch my book, but um, I get I get into this at, towards the end of my book. <laughs> the idea of whether these experiences can be considered imminent or transcendent. Um, well, I see that to the it's online, so uh, it's not. Oh, it's it <laughs> imminent. Oh, is it? Oh, good. It's imminent. Even better. Even better. As long as somebody, as long as somebody's imminently reading it's imminently it, and it's not this available. transcendent thing unavailable. Uh, on that note, I think we can uh, wrap it Good. up. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you, James, and uh, all right. thank you yeah. all for um, uh, yeah, it's all fun. everybody uh, watching and listening at home uh, and everywhere in the world um, for joining us on this stream. Uh, it will be available, of course, after on the on the Westin Hag website, westinhag.nl, and uh, that's. Uh, um, and uh, I just want to, uh, another program note, I guess, uh, we're going, we may not be back next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday after with Andreas, uh, San, Andrea Sanjacomo, who is the um, F uh, Spinoza chair and uh, professor at the University of Groningen in north of uh, the Netherlands. Um, on this Sunday, however, there's a Spinoza circle, which is a reading circle uh, where we actually just read primary uh, materials, uh, i.e. Spinoza. And uh, we are doing our second session on, on the common notions. So uh, we'll all be sitting around. And uh, one of the interesting things about the Spinoza circle, which we have been running for a year, 
uh, more than a year, uh, is that, of course, now that we're online, a lot of people can join in from all around the world, uh, which makes a very different environment. Uh, usually we have a quite an intimate environment, about 20 people at the, in the auditorium of the former U.S. Embassy in, uh, in, uh, to the Netherlands in The Hague. Uh, but uh, now uh, everybody can join in uh, and uh, read some Spinoza with us. We'll be reading from the ethics, of course, because we're talking about that, those tricky, tricky uh, common notions from the three forms of knowledge, as uh, we touched Very on today. Important. Very mm -hmm. important. <laughs> James uh, Very vouches important. for that. So um, if you want to know about that, you can also uh, find out about it on the Westin Hag website. Just look for Spinoza Circles or uh, Baruch Spinoza and the Arts or uh, Spinoza and the Arts or something like that. And, uh, and this one, I, I mean, I'm really uh, very satisfied and very happy that we did get to touch a lot on the arts or on aesthetic experience. And uh, that, that I have to thank you again uh, very much, James, for uh, uh, joining me today and, uh, and discussing your ideas and your work. Thank you, Burgess. Really fun. Okay, thanks a lot. And Thank so we're going to sign out really now. Uh, check us out and uh, keep following uh, Westenhagen and following uh, the Spinoza sessions. Goodbye for now. <laughs>